Um, so welcome to this meeting of the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group. Um, so this is an interest group that's uh, co-facilitated by uh, the Australian Data Archive and ARDC, um, where we come together every month or so and hear about interesting and exciting things that are happening in the space of sensitive data. I'd like to start by um, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting today. Uh, so for me here in Perth, that's the Wajak Noongar people, but uh, it's many different peoples across Australia uh, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, yep, as I just said, um, we are recording. Um, because I think this is a very interesting topic and there will be a lot of people who will want to catch up after the fact. Um, that does mean that if you have your camera or mic on, then you might be in the recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, I would recommend that you turn those things off. Um, I'd also request you turn your microphone off anyway. You should be um, muted uh, just because there are quite a lot of us in here today. So we will take questions via the chat and then um, throw them to Georgie towards the end. Um, so uh, today we're um, really excited to hear from the Office of the National Data Commissioner about how they are helping to streamline researchers' access to Australian government data. And uh, for Georgie, uh, this is a, a group of a very diverse um, range of people who work with and are interested in sensitive data. We hear from um, many different disciplines, uh, many different uh, practices, so technical level things, governance level things. Um, it's really a space where we can come together and try and um, find the places where there are intersections in our work and hopefully find common solutions. But um, we're yet yeah, very uh, interested to hear today about what the ONDC has been doing. And um, I will in a moment share a link um, once I stop sharing my screen, I'll share a link for everyone to our communal notes document where we can all take notes together um, as we listen to Georgie present. Um, so I think that's everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so today, just to give you some context, that's why um, I'm here, what the ONDC is doing, and I'll just chat you through what what a bit more on data place as a, as a platform. Um, feel free to flick to the next slide, um, Nicola. Um, oh, obviously, the large cherry is not here, so unfortunately, it's just me talking the whole time. Um, but basically, I'll just run through a quick overview and then how, how someone actually gets on to Data Place and then some of those just key services that are available. Um, and then I might just stop for questions. I think that would be um, better. I won't dwell too much on the functionality. Um, next slide. Oh, please just keep going. Yeah, so I suppose just reiterating what I mentioned before, DataPlace is a whole of government um, um, platform that's digital services platform that's designed to coordinate access to Australian government data, both for the DAT scheme, but also it's not limited to the DAT scheme. And so what we mean by that is DataPlace will be a single place to facilitate connections between aid organisations seeking Australian government data and Australian government agencies, so um, the Department of Health, the Department of um, uh, Industry, for instance, um, who actually hold um, data and, and are able to share it for certain um, purposes. Um, basically, um, the idea is the platform will enable and encourage safe data sharing and put some really good best practice guides into the processes so that um, both the organisations requesting data and entering into data sharing agreements and the custodians who hold data um, are working in a consistent and streamlined way and making sure that they're um, applying the right controls and frameworks over that data sharing to make sure that it's safe to do so. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the key services and kind of what their key functions are and how they work together to, to achieve that outcome. Um, it's just worth calling out because it we have it as a question all the time. DataPlace doesn't transmit um, or store the data that is actually being requested or shared. It is very much a governance and monitoring tool for um, data sharing. So the actual trans transmission of data and the sharing of data occurs 
per project within the relevant um, secure location. For instance, it might use the ABS data lab, or if it's really high level aggregate data, there might be no need to share within such secure locations. And it's just, um, it's really a fit for purpose um, sharing mechanism there. But yeah, data place really is a governance tool for, for the sake of those on the, on the line that love governance. And it's very much to help um, manage and coordinate the sharing of data as opposed to actually the sharing. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so who's it for? So there's a few concepts that we um, talk about here is data users, and these could be organisations, researchers, commonwealth and state and territory governments, or um, private sector businesses seeking access to data um, in the public benefit. So, you know, they, they have to actually um, be that it's not just a request service for requesting any type of data, they do have to articulate how it would benefit um, the public. Um, the concept of data custodians, which in for data place is Australian government agencies. So that's not state and territory agencies, but just Australian government agencies um, at this point in time, because it's a federal level um, uh, digital services platform. And we have uh, the concept of data service providers, which are basically specialty providers that um, help with data integration or complex um, data services and things like that. So they participate on data place as kind of to help data custodians put controls in place for their data sharing agreement and actually facilitate this exchange of um, data. Um, a great example of a potential data service provider is some of the Australian, um, the AIAs that currently exists, so um, the ABS, and there's a few state and territory um, service providers that would make that, um, would kind of make that definition. And then also the general public, we have a commitment um, as part of the DAT scheme, but just more broadly on data place to be really transparent about the data sharing that's occurring so that um, the public can see at an aggregate level. So it's obviously not just, you know, open to the general public at an aggregate level, um, what kind of data has been shared and for what reasons, um, just to kind of keep building that trust and understanding um, as to why the government shares data and um, to improve its you know, policy development, for instance. Um, next slide, please. Um, when we talk about what success looks like from data place, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier as well, is um, we really want to enable greater use of data by more users in a safe way to make sure we're realising the value of Australian government data. Um, the, our key strategic objectives then are increasing access to that data to a broader user group. Um, whilst also increasing the maturity of Australian government data sharing practices um, and also increasing public trust to maintain a social license um, for sharing data. And there's some kind of key, I'm sorry, I've got a dog joining me besides the, this presentation. <laughs> sit, sit down, Boogie. <laughs> she really wants to be involved. <laughs> Uh, so there are kind of key strategic outcomes and, you know, th that's what we're looking to see um, over the next three years whilst we um, continue to ramp up in this program. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so um, I mentioned how we uh, connect organisations to, um, uh, to to be able to actually coordinate data sharing. So these are the key services that Data Place offer, offers to actually be able to enable that to occur. So it's just worth calling out anything in a light blue is technically not delivered by the Data Place platform. However, it's just recognizing that it's kind of part of the value chain and um, it's important to acknowledge that there is some key um, things that happen outside of the platform to, to enable data sharing um, with Australian government data. So, when we talk about Discover, um, on the Data Place platform, we have a very interim solution, shall we say, on how we make sure a request goes to the right custodian because no one is very clear um, about which custodians hold which data and who the request should go to. So in absence of an Australian data catalogue for all Australian government data, um, we have a search functionality on Data Place that um, you can kind of enhance with keywords. Um, it's a great first step. However, um, the ONDC is actually running a 
separate program of work called the Australian Government Data Catalogue and Inventories Program. And it's really looking at how to make data um, more discoverable. And our, some of our colleagues from the um, ADRC are obviously um, online and they're very much helping us with that project as well. The idea is that data place would actually use that catalogue once it's completed to actually better direct requests to the right um, organisation. So it's a, re a real enhancement. But in terms of the services data place office offers, there's an onboarding and registration process. And that's really just about getting your organisation set up on the platform so that, you know, with some key um, information so that we can basically help facilitate all of the other services. Um, we ask data custodians to onboard onto data place in order to um, make sure that they're receiving notifications. They're right, the right areas within their organization are being informed of the requests coming into them and they're able to respond um, through the platform. Accreditation is very aligned to the requirements of the da data scheme. So it's an accreditation process for data users. Um, it, they basically can put in an application and, and through that process, they can actually start requesting data under the DAT scheme and therefore um, um, be regulated by the ONDC. That's available on DataPlace as well. Um, and actually, as of yesterday, it's available to government users to actually start applying for accreditation if they um, wanted to. Um, but the really exciting stuff, I, I think personally, is how you get to data sharing. And we have an inquiry and request process. So basically, as an organisation, you can, you can draft up a data request and send it to one or many Australian government agencies, um, the same request in order to get a response as to whether or not there is an intent to share data. Um, how this works is you fill out the form. It follows a similar process to the data sharing principles. So the project people at a very high level and you know really asks data users to articulate their what, they, what they're trying to achieve by accessing that data so that the data custodian can look at the, that request and consider it in line and assess it in line with kind of whether or not they can they can actively share that data or if there's any barriers or concerns that need to be addressed. Um, uh, so, and then, so as part of that request process, at the end of your request process, you'll get an in principle agreement to share from the data custodian, or you will receive a reason for refusal. So they have to basically articulate when they're closing out a request, why they weren't able to progress that request and requesters can actually see the progress of where their request is at at all times, which is really something we heard in our discovery as being very valuable because um, at the moment it's quite opaque and no one really knows where a request might go. It also has a really great ability to be transferred between custodians. So if for some reason, and we do expect this, that the custodian selected isn't actually the holder of that data, rather than asking the requester to go fill out a different process at a different agency, they can just transfer the request to the correct custodian um, all in system and they're not, they're not required to fill out any more information. So that's really beneficial. And then at the end of that in principle agreement, um, you would actually then start to talk, um, discuss how you um, would enter in and to a data sharing agreement process with those custodians and that's really a lot more of a detailed understanding and effort around how you might um, control put the controls in place around that data so it's shared safely data place this service is still in design on data um, still underway on data place but we do have a bit of a conceptual understanding of what are the key um, sections that would be included in a data sharing agreement and what are some common terms that um, terms and clauses that should just kind of by default be in data sharing agreements to try and take some of the complexity out of um, which agreement you use in what circumstances. And at the end of that kind of collaboration agreement process, there's also a collection of um, key monitoring information to enable custodians and data users to actually um, keep track of their data sharing agreements and what they're actually meant to be doing. And for instance, if there's controls around the destruction of data, what dates that's meant to occur on and, and we're able to actually notify um, the relevant parties, you know, that that the, the date for data destruction is approaching. And, you know, obviously the nuances of that is 
maybe the project is two months delayed and they can go in and update that agreement and, and just say that the data destruction would occur two, two months later. Um, but basically it's all tracked in system is the idea. And obviously um, from an ONDC perspective, it's really useful for us to be able to see and help report on um, those using the DAT scheme. So we would use it to perform our regulatory functions, but also more broadly to inform um, kind of a, the Australian government around the health of the data sharing ecosystem and, and what's going on and how many requests are actually getting, you know, refused and for what reasons and whether or not there's any um, interventions that might occur there. Um, so that's a really, really very detailed overview of kind of how the different services on data place work to help um, make it easier to request Australian government data. Um, I'll just flick through to the next slide. I think I've covered off a lot of this stuff here anyway, but just so everyone can see. Um, oh, that was our engagement. We've done a, basically a lot of um, user research on this and um, over the course of 18 months and with heaps of input from different organisation types, which has been really valuable um, in our designs. Um, and then um, next slide. This is kind of our, our roadmap um, of when certain services will actually start appearing and coming online, which is probably less relevant. Um, now we've actually gone live for June and the rest just keep coming. Basically, it's gonna be a busy year. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so key, some key things to be aware of is when you're actually accessing the platform, there's a few key kind of administrative roles that are associated with per organization. One's an org admin and, and they're really responsible for managing their own um, uh, uh, the, their own staff and how they use the data place platform, both on the custodian side, but also on the data user side. We heard quite strongly that in some cases, organizations also didn't know that certain areas of their business were requesting data, the same data from the same custodian. So this is also just a really useful oversight mechanism. So organizations are acting in a more coordinated way as well, and, and there's efficiencies gained there. There's a concept of an authorized officer as well, which is someone that effectively just needs to be in place with a level of authority to sign off on a data sharing agreement when once the um, kind of negotiations for that have been included. And then we have a concept of a data coordinator. This is more, more so used for data custodians as they might have um, different business divisions that they wanna put in this role to be able to see at a higher level, all the different types of requests coming into their organization so that they can assign them to the appropriate people in their teams. Um, however, this role could be used if you wanted to say on the, on the data user side, if you wanted um, different business areas to have a slightly more um, um, reporting level view of the types of requests going to the Australian government. We have heard though that from a university perspective, they wouldn't want anyone in this role um, because they don't want the request to be seen by by other, say schools, um, for instance. So there is actually a mechanism where you can just add specific people to a request that you wanted to see it and then no one else can see it. So that's kind of the key roles and how data place works. And, um, custodians have been designing some internal processes around um, these roles so that they can, I think someone mentioned they've already got existing um, uh, existing agreements and, and processes in place. The custodians are really just looking at how they can assign these roles to kind of accommodate their existing processes and, and you know, amend them when necessary, but realistically they could still um, run their divisions the same way they wanted to. It's just that this is a platform coordinating requests into them. Um, and there's a the concept of a general user, which is just anybody who wants to jump onto DataPlace, they just have to go through an authentication service, um, which will associate them with the organization. They have fairly base level permissions. They can kind of get on there and they can raise a request, but um, they can't see all that much more across the platform unless they're involved in the activity. So it's just, that's just a great way to um, make sure people, are, the right people are associated with the right organizations coming onto the platform, but um, that you don't have to add them individually as a organization. Um, uh, data.gov is user request data page. That, that, that's exactly the intent of DataPlace um, is actually to align 
it to data.gov um, because we recognize data.gov is really great for open data and this is really that next level down of um, sensitive data that may be of value to share. So we are working quite closely with, um, it's now the ABS who um, operate data.gov.au to actually coordinate and um, make sure those these two services are complementary of each other. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, this is just talking about those authentication services, which I mentioned, and I think there was a question on that. Um, there's three services technically you can log into. Um, Vanguard, which is run by the Department of Industry and free, really easy to sign up. Um, if organisations don't want to sign up to that service and set that up, um, there's the MyGov ID and RAM um, services. There's a bit more of a user overhead for using that service though, so we definitely would recommend Vanguard. And for the university sector, we have integrated the Australian Access Federation um, authentication method as well, because we heard that um, across the university sector, that was a preferred um, authentication method. So that's kind of the login details. Um, I also did notice there was a um, data sharing agreement around um, Creative Commons. Um, it's worth noting that there's some terms that must be in a data sharing agreement for to satisfy it for the DAT scheme. The DAT scheme. However, because we are looking at a whole of government um, approach, we do recognise that in some circumstances, um, a data sharing agreement would be really valuable, but maybe doesn't need to have an extensive list of terms because the way that the data is, um, the controls are placed on the data and curated, that a lot of um, the risk is managed that way. So the, the agreement can be quite straightforward and we are aware of the Creative Commons as a, a good base for us. What we would like to call as our um, kind of our base level data sharing agreement. And then as the data sharing gets more and more complex and there might be more say legal authority issues and things like that, we would add in more terms as relevant um, to, to the type of sharing that's occurring. And I might just get you to flip to the next. Uh, this is the organizational profile. Basically, that's just how a organization manages their different users. So, you know, just very similar to how you might see any kind of platform. It's just that ability to kind of keep track of who's actually operating and um, really useful from a, um, a governance perspective, even within your own organization. That's what we've heard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is kind of what the request dashboard looks like. So depending on which role you're in, you see more or less in this view. Um, but you can basically see all of the requests here that have been sent and to who and by who and kind of um, when the last time they there were a response. And then if you want more information, you can click into the request, depending on whether or not you're a, a data coordinator or a general user, you'll only see requests that you've raised, or if you're a data coordinator, you can see more details about that request. Um, likewise, there's also a dashboard for say custodians to see which requests have been sent to them from one place. So they can see all of the requests currently open for their organization. Um, next. Um, this is really, our, I think I mentioned our discover interim um, solution this is really what we're what we're saying here it's a bit of a keyword search and it brings up potential suggestions of which custodian to send um, send your request to the custodians can can edit this search by putting in keywords in their organizational profile so it'll over time we're expecting it to get um, more accurate as they kind of get used to the types of words and search terms that um, organizations put in to understand which um, custodian it might go to. Um, next, please. Um, that's basically what the request form looks like. It's um, pretty simple, fairly open minded um, question, open questions, and really just trying to get to the heart of the data sharing principles just to get the requester thinking about um, why they they need that project data for their project and some of the considerations that the custodian might ask them. So it's really just about helping uplift. Um, yeah, and uh, if you go to the next question, next slide, 
this is kind of the the data custodian view of when what when they get your request then they there's an assessment process so they can actually see who sent it to them if they need any more information they can get in contact with you really easily and you can um, work through that data request together so it's really about bringing the two parties together and making sure that they're on the same page before um, proceeding to a formal assessment and then basically what happens is the data custodian sorry next slide um, um, will assess the re request based off some some key attributes is it available do they have any legal authority to share um, you know can it be done safely have they thought about and the data sharing principles and is it um, a viable option and just any administrative issues that might influence so you know maybe the request is to get harder in two days time and it's not um, possible to actually fulfill that request in that time or um, that there's a cost associated with extracting that data so um, that the data request has to be aware of that and agree to pay that cost um, prior for them proceeding and so basically they would send you back a response and it's you know against this criteria you get a summary of their assessment which is really valuable um, and if you go to the next slide basically um, oh, yep yeah, you they can notify you of what's happening um, and you'll get as a data requester a notification back and I think that's the last slide just covers off what what the requester has to do once um, yeah, once you've actually got a response from a data custodian, you as a requester just need to accept that you're comfortable and, and to move into the data sharing agreement process. Or in, in some cases, it might be that you're not going to proceed because the costs associated, for instance, um, aren't appropriate for you. So that's, I suppose, the, the request service and how it's intending to work um, at the moment. There's a lot of questions. Um, Happy, are you, were you about to jump into the questions? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to. Okay. Um, I, I was trying to track them and, and jot down one or two, so I'm happy to try and mediate on the fly. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I think there was a question that a couple of people asked, and actually it's the last one in there as well, as just a similar concept. So a number of um, agencies, government agencies, already have uh, procedures in place for requesting uh, and providing access to data. Does data place replace those existing processes? So in the first instance, all existing processes remain the same. Um, and then basically what we're asking is that organizations work to slowly um, move onto the data place platform. However, because the platform doesn't um, can actually you can actually assign different business areas into different roles they can still actually use it so if if a request comes through data place that is technically may have gone through an existing service they can still get access to and still respond to this request using this platform um, and they still might assess it in a similar way um, but yeah there's a there's a a long term i suppose adoption of the platform and we're, we're seeing that whilst custodians are signing up they'll slowly roll it out and kind of um, update their internal processes to start using it. However, it is the preferred um, way to request Australian government data. Great. Um, another question around, so uh, you had in an earlier slide that workflow, um, starting with discover and ending with, I can't remember. What Ma the manage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Monitor and close, Monitor. I suppose, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the middle step in there was inquire and request. And so the request is, uh, I think you showed us the, um, filling in the form, but provide all the information. Um, can you speak a little bit about the inquire stage and maybe also around, um, so we've discussed this before and I know a bit of the background of it, but does the platform actually allow there to be, um, a chat? backwards and forwards between the requester and the custodian. Yeah, so that's a really good pickup. So we what we've done is deployed the request service, um, just the request service so, so far as our first release. But when we were doing quite a lot of our um, user discovery, we did hear that sometimes an organization doesn't really know if they need data, but they do need to understand if it's 
if it's possible and and I suppose help help design what their request might even look like um, and so that's what the inquire process is really about it's actually about not asking a, a researcher for instance to go down a very long um, comp well, it's not long but a more considered request process um, because in they might just not realize necessarily what data they want if they even want data they just really have a problem statement that they're trying to understand um, so the inquiry inquiry process is definitely it's using similar functionality to the request process but a lot shorter and sharper types of you know what what is the purpose and what are you trying to look for and it just allows the custodian to actually propose what data might be useful for them um, ahead of even putting in a formal request um, so we are looking to bring that on that service on later but um, we heard that it was really valuable in terms of both really really new researchers that aren't really sure what type of data they might be able to get but also um, it satisfied a lot of other really complex um, data sharing requests that allowed um, kind of the organizations to actually work together to figure out what the request should even have in it so that they can actually just um, once once they actually get to the request stage they're actually quite clear what data they're requesting and for what reasons well ahead of um, well ahead of actually putting it in so that's what the inquiry and request is really looking for it's just that um, the request process we are released first obviously because um, gets to the heart of the issue faster, but we are looking to bring the inquiry process on um, later in the um, development of the platform. Okay, brilliant. Um, there was a question around uh, how requests are assessed. So once it gets to that stage, is there a standard procedure that custodians will follow? Is there a standard set of criteria or, or process that will be used? So there's a standard set of questions that we are prompting them to consider definitely. They can also add in anything additional that they feel is necessary. Just what we were hearing is um, some of some types of data might just require a little bit more um, consideration, for instance. But realistically, um, we've got the core assessment is quite consistent. And then just whilst we're learning and, and figuring out, we you know, is there more assessment criteria that we need to be considered? There's just some flexibility in that assessment process for them to add in and um, request any additional information that they might need. Okay. Um, so I'm seeing on that screen there a lot of the kind of practical aspects of assessing your requests. Is there a um, principles element? I mean, we're all broadly aware that the Data Bill Act, sorry, is um, uh, had a, a five safe frame of reference. Is yeah. that part of the assessment? Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. The data sharing principles is a, is a, is similar to the five safes, very much um, following the same kind of risk framework. And the assessment process looks at and prompts the data custodian to consider those elements. It's worth mentioning though, in the request process, it's very early days. So it's you might not even know specifically which data you're getting at that point in time. It's just getting them to do kind of a high level assessment. Um, where the where the real um, kind of controls might come into play and the the decisions around which data sharing principles and controls you need to put in place is very much later on in the agreement process. However, we just wanted to start bringing in um, the five states really early, so you know there was some consideration as to whether or not the request was even possible because it was you know actually able to be done under um, a safe sharing framework. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So there, while we've been um, doing this back and forth, there have been a lot more questions come in that I'm, uh, I, I can't read and think at the same time, unfortunately. Um, so the last question that I jotted down before the influx of questions was around um, how would a researcher, and I'm assuming that using the example of, say, a, a university-based researcher, um, actually place a request? Uh, are they going... Uh, can they get onto the system directly? Do they have to go through someone in their institution? What does that look like? Yeah, so their organization will have to actually onboard onto the platform. So what we mean by that is accept the set up the digital identity services so that um, 
members of their organization can access data place um, and then actually assign themselves an organizational admin role so that they have that oversight and they understand that they have to manage users from that point any kind of researcher could jump on the platform and put in a request it's just you'd be aware that the organizations agreed to be on it and that there's an that someone in your organization is looking at the different users that are getting in there and putting in requests so it's very easy for a researcher to put in a request um, once the organization has decided to use data place. Right. Um, okay, now, Nicola, I don't know if you're monitoring the questions. Um, I could have a thing, but I <laughs> take a look. I, I have a question up um, from Tim around how's this new press? process speed things up or and rather than add a layer of complexity. Um, what we heard a lot of it with all of our research was um, there is absolutely no way of knowing where your request is up to. So you can't even speed it up because you have no idea where it is, who's it sitting with, what's the hold up. Um, so if one aspect of that is because this is visible and basically um, we can send reminders and notifications based on the request submitted. We can um, nudge behavior to speed things up. Like obviously we can't force a decision. I think that, that but that's an important step that needs to um, be decided alongside the researcher and the custodian. What it does do is create a lot of transparency and what's going on and where the holdups are. And the, as a regulator, the ONDC sees themselves as being able to you know, learn from that and understand whether or not we can provide additional guidance or, um, you know, address capability um, gaps and consistency more with our kind of educational role as well. So I suppose the first thing is we can't really tell where the complexity and what's holding things up because it's so opaque. So it really brings um, the request process into, into um, a much visible um, process. And we, every custodian has to provide a reason for refusal. Um, on data place, regardless of whether it's a DAT scheme, we think it's just best practice that they close out a data request. Um, and from that, we can also start to learn and look at interventions around what is a reasonable reason to say no and where could we maybe um, help educate and improve that process as well. Great. Um, I'm seeing a, a few questions around the theme of, of cost. So is there uh, I guess, broadly speaking, are there costs to get onto the platform? Are there costs to request data or to access data? How does that work and how do people find out about those costs? Yeah, so there's no cost to get onto data place. Um, there is no cost. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. So there's no cost to, to actually access the platform or put a request in. However, um, the custodians are able to charge cost recovery on the on a data sharing request if they wish to so some um, agencies already have kind of some standard policies around how much they charge per request and what types of requests they tend to do um, so that they basically will provide that information to you as as part of the request process if if that's the case in some cases the agency may not charge because it is such a small um, kind of administrative overhead for them and they just see it as being part of their role as in delivering public benefit as well. So it really, it will depend on the complexity of the request as to how much money it will um, will cost. Uh, I had a great example from um, the Department of Education where someone asked for their entire data warehouse in two days and they, <laughs> they said, well, we couldn't possibly do that because it would cost you way too much money and we couldn't meet the time frame. So, you know, I think it's a little bit, um, the, the benefit of this process is that it's starting to bring together and educate people on that, on how that all works as well. Okay, and so the um, so it varies depending on the request and the agency and and so on. And that um, information about the cost, there isn't a place that people can go to. Like, there's not a website that people can go to and find that out. They actually it it comes out through during the request back yeah. and forth. Yeah. yeah. Um. There was a question just about. Is it similar to Data Lab? Absolutely not. Um, data Lab is a secure data access location. We see the two working quite complementary together. So um, Data Place helps kind of figure out 
you know, do they need to actually use the data lab to, to get access to that data? And, and if so, um, that's just documented in the data sharing agreement. Um, but the actual access to data would still be facilitated by the ABS, for instance, if that was the decided control. So um, we actually, we're, we're coming up to time. I see that there are some, some interesting and some quite complex questions that we may not have time for. So I wonder, Georgie, um, if we might be able to compile those questions and, um, and send them to you and we could um, put answers in our um, collaborative document. So that way, um, we can get to the few that we're not going to have time for now. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah, no worries. Actually, I think there's a bit of a theme there as well um, around, you know, we've got a number of uh, researchers and research sector, university uh, staff and, and infrastructure operators asking, all right, how, how do we get involved in this? Um, you said that you've done consultation. Is there something uh, where they can connect to ONDC and DataPlace directly to, to be part of that discussion and ask questions, or, or can we facilitate that? Um, I would encourage, so the ONDC is actually running a whole heap of um, informa general information sessions over the next um, couple of months. Ones, um, some are scheme specific. There is one specific to getting onto DataPlace, so just the information you might need as an organisation. And from, I'm just, I've got to check these dates, from the, 15th of August, um, DataPlace will be open to um, universities and and the like to put in data requests. So it, it might be really useful to come to some of those sessions um, just to get ready and, and see what you might need to do if your organisation is interested in participating and in that. Georgie, um, we're just about to send out that list of um, information sessions through our um, newsletter and uh, also externally as well yeah they're um they're really great and they'll they'll point you to just extra information and any guides around how to get on board and things like that so you know um you can do a little bit of have a bit of a read of those um and figure out kind of your next steps as well brilliant um well that's that's us on the hour so um I think we just have time to thank Georgie so much um, for that presentation, uh, particularly in the face of extensive and, and multiple <laughs> technical issues. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, no, it's um, it's really interesting work. Yes, please. If you ever want to know about a data request process, I feel like I've been living and breathing it for the last eighteen months. So very happy to chat. <laughs>